All right, now it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for our session today, ASCE Texas Section Vice President for Technical Affairs, Ron Reichert. Hey, thanks, Mike, and welcome, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you attending today and giving up an hour of your day to spend with us. We have part two of the Beyond Storm series today, a very relevant topic, and I, based on attendance, I'm there I see a lot of interest here. Uh, just know this is part of what ASCE Texas Section does, and part of our, uh, our goals are to provide technical content and learning opportunities for folks who can't necessarily get to a branch meeting, and you can attend from all over the state. It is free for members of Texas Section. If you are not a member, please consider joining. It is a valuable tool to uh, improve your knowledge base. That having been said, I am going to hand it over to VP Technical Elect, Mark Boyd, who will be taking over VP Technical Duties next month. Uh, Mark is going to handle introductions and moderating. And once again, thanks, everyone. Thanks to our presenters. And the floor is yours, Mark. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ron. Um, hello, everybody. I, I am Mark Boyd. The, the current VP Technical Elect, as Ron said, Bill going to fill in uh, into, uh, into Ron's big shoes here in, in just over a month. Um, I'm also a member of this committee, uh, just by way of, of, of telling you where I come from, why I'm involved in this. I'm a principal engineer um, at Managing Engineering Partner at LCA Environmental, and I joined just a few years after their founding 30 years ago, um, been doing environmental engineering my whole career, and I have 35 years of civil and environmental engineering pollution assessment, cleanup, and prevention experience. I've also served on the adjunct faculty of the SMU Bobby B. Lyle School of Engineering for about 20 years. And I teach graduate level specialty courses in groundwater pollution, fate and transport and wastewater treatment. As far as my role at Texas ASCE, in addition to my current position as VP Tech Elect, in part providing leadership for the efforts involved with these webinars, and Ron's been doing a great job with them. I've worn many hats, hats at the section and at branch level. My most recent role was as the chair lead of the 55 member committee uh, developing a Texas ASCE's 2021 infrastructure report card. In fact, our heroic leader of this committee, uh, Jeff Roberts, led that report card subcommittee. And uh, one of our speakers today, Wes Oliphant, was on the national report card committee. Uh, and all that interest in energy uh, sparked uh, uh, in, in the 2021 storms around the same time the report card came out, uh, sparked the creation of this committee. Uh, my committee colleagues on the presentation today are Oliver Smith and Wes Oliphant, and they'll introduce themselves. But I just want to say that it's been my privilege to be on board with this highly qualified committee. And uh, taking, I'm taking a small role helping to develop and what we, we hope is viewed as an objective vision uh, beyond the winter storms of 2021. We're very proud of our report available on the section website as it's received national acclaim from Forbes magazine, which provided recognition that Texas ASCE as the knowledgeable experts on this subject, as well as uh, positive, uh, uh, let's see, lost my, my way here, as well as positive response at the local legislative, public, and engineering community for its breadth, depth, and objectivity. This all-volunteer committee has gone to great lengths to avoid the blame game with an, uh, with an earnest effort to present a fact-based, informative product designed to point toward real solutions um, <clears throat> to, the, uh, to the problems that we've that we've faced. Apologize, I lost my way here a little bit again. Um, uh, this message uh, deserves repeating. Uh, uh, we're well qualified, hardworking, all volunteer uh, committee intent on accurate description of the problem while providing solutions without engaging in blame, uh, in blame, uh, in flamethrowing, the blame game. Um, could you, Mike, could you, thanks for going to slide two. Keep in mind that we are preparing you 
you as Texas ASCE members and non-member friends of Texas ASCE to be able to provide constructive explanations to the general public of why the Texas electric grid is so vulnerable to stresses caused by weather extremes. But you know that the committee quickly concluded it was not just about the weather and realized that the grid is vulnerable even without extreme conditions. But the extreme weather exposed the weaknesses we could all clearly see in the end. Our hope is that these webinars will in turn play an important role in instructing plans and rules uh, uh, proposed uh, by public officials that promote and advocate for reliability and resilience towards grid enforce reinforcement in the face of climate change challenges. Webinar one was an overall view of the grid and the decision, and I hope you, you were able to see that. I've repeated some of the things I said that day that lead to the uh, uh, vulnerabilities to weather extremes that we all experienced. Today's webinar will get you more deeply into the energy and electrical grid power production operations and their essential interconnections, and also how the weaknesses in these interconnections were triggered toward a real, uh, toward a near collapse, and that's not an exaggeration, that's not hyperbole, a near collapse of the grid. I hope you find what you hear today to be informative and insightful. Our purpose is to broaden everyone's understanding and insight into the complexities involved in producing and supporting good policy to address the issues we're all aware of. We're more specifically, the second webinar will deal with critical infrastructure system inter interdependencies of our energy and electrical infrastructure and supporting delivery physical and market systems and processes. If you like today's web webinar, I invite you to stay tuned to future webinars. Part three of the water is gonna be about water systems uh, on September 6th, part four, telecom and transportation on October 25th, and network inter interdependence and the committee's overall conclusions and recommendations will be presented in our final webinar uh, on December 13th. These future webinars will drill deeply into the challenges and systemic problems and solutions. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Oliver to continue today's presentation. And thank you so much for attending. Please post your questions on chat so that we may address any comments and questions at the end of the presentation. Oliver, it's your show. Thank you, Ron and Mark, <clears throat> for the introduction to today's webinar. I am Oliver Smith a member of ASCE since 1974 when I was a civil engineering student at Michigan State University, where I got my BS in 1975 and my MS in 1988. I have practiced engineering leadership in civil construction environments, program management, manufacturing and supply chain activities for 47 years with the Army Corps of Engineers, Exxon Company USA, BASF Corporation, Frito-Lay, CH2M Hill, which is now a part of Jacobs, and finally 3M Company. Today I will be drawing on my early experience in oil and natural gas production gleaned from my time as an upstream fuel production engineer at Exxon's Houston district, where I was responsible for six oil and natural gas producing fields in Sugarland, Rosenberg, New Gulf, and Wharton, Texas. Let's begin with an analysis of what really happened on February 15th, 2021 to expose what affected natural gas production. As you examine this chart, note that natural gas production in the Permian Basin began to decrease on February 10th, 2021 due to freeze off, which is the freezing of process equipment, especially control valves in the production systems of the individual wells. As the sub 40 degree temperatures continued, an increasing number of wells ceased to produce. Now note that the most dramatic decrease in natural gas production occurred on Sunday and Monday, February 14th and 15th, which coincided with the load shed activities ordered by ERCOT to keep the electrical power grid from destabilizing and collapsing. <clears throat> It is important to reflect on the fact that while freezing weather initially restricted gas flow from Texas fields, uh, 
The greatest impact was tied to interruption of electrical power to the wells and production equipment in the upstream and midstream operations. Once natural gas production decreased by a significant percentage, the interdependence of the fuel gas supply with power generation facilities exacerbated the challenges of supplying power to Texans over the period during which winter storms Uri and Viola affected our 254 counties. To characterize the catalysts leading to the interruption of electrical energy, gen, uh, electrical energy generation requires an understanding of the elements of the entire natural gas production and processing supply chain. As you look at this chart, showing the interconnectedness of the Texas infrastructure, the main takeaway is that everything that provides Texans with support for living and business operations is tied together to greater or lesser extents. Our focus will be on the connection between upstream and midstream natural gas production operations and electrical power generation and distribution and how reliability and resilience incorporated into these operations would look and function in mitigating the impacts of extreme weather events and climate change. Next slide. The value chain for the production, transport, and distribution of oil and natural gas looks like this. Upstream production in the field includes the drilled well borehole, wellhead extraction, that is the Christmas tree as you've heard it called, separation of oil, natural gas, and produced water with separator vessels, and then the compression or pumping, compression of natural gas or pumping of oil to move products to the next phase of uh, production. Midstream processing is referenced for natural gas refining, which has the objective of separating the higher molecular weight components of natural gas, which are propane, butane, and ethane, for use as fuel or for cracking into ethylene. The remaining methane is what is directed to industrial and power generation operations for consumption as fuel gas, as well as being distributed directly to the public for household heating and cooking. As I stated earlier, winter storms Uri and Viola exposed weaknesses in the ability of the natural gas upstream and midstream operations to tolerate extended periods of cold weather, namely temperatures that remain below 40 degrees for extended periods of time. The more telling aspect of the interruption of the flow of natural gas to power generators was the impact of load shed on upstream and midstream operations. And I will discuss that in greater detail as the webinar progresses. So what components of the midstream, upstream and midstream natural gas production operations appeared most vulnerable to the effects of this Texas cold weather event? This is a standard well layout showing components from the borehole through the Christmas tree to control valves, oil, gas and water separators and on to pumping and compression, pumping of oil, compression of natural gas for transport to midstream facilities. Produced fluids are separated into oil, produced water or fracking water and salt water and natural gas is shown. Electrical power needed for production is almost exclusively provided by the Texas electrical power grid. In some unique and limited instances, natural gas fire turbines or wind, wind solar units generate power to ups, operate upstream production controls and equipment. Now take a good look at this well production separator bank. I want you to notice two things. First, the number of control valves used to control flow through the separation stage of the upstream production process and the exclusive application of electrical power for the separator process controls, including these valves. 
What does this tell you about upstream production vulnerabilities? Well, it tells you that there are numerous valves that are instigating a pressure drop in the system. And that pressure drop across the valves facilitates the formation of hydrates, which crystallize when amb ambient temperatures drop below 40 degrees for sustained periods of time, as I alluded to earlier. Interruption of the supply of electricity to the wellhead and separators automatically causes the well production operation to shut in to prevent loss of control of the fluid and gas production and subsequent pollution of the surrounding environment. Now let us examine midstream processing and its impact as a part of natural gas supply chain on availability of natural gas to power generation operations downstream. As you, don't, as you no doubt know, natural gas is widely used for industrial process steam and heat production, for residential and commercial environmental heating, and for electrical power generation. Gas must be conditioned to meet contractually defined specifications prior to use as fuel gas by power generators and industrial facilities. Conditioning consists <clears throat> of removing or reducing impurities, namely water, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and helium, and harvesting high molecular weight products, ethane, propane, butane, for cracking into ethylene and for liquid fuel applications. Methane exists exiting a typical gas processing plant. <clears throat> will provide fuel gas that has a gross heating value varying between 950 and 1050 BTUs per SCF or British thermal units per standard cubic foot. After natural gas liquid extraction, the treated natural gas stream that is mostly methane, meeting the desired fuel gas specifications, is sent through compression and measurement meters to the pipelines, interstate and intrastate, for transmission or to, for, to the point of use. As for midstream, as most midstream operations have electrically powered motors and controls for fluid pumping and compression, interruption of the supply of electrical power significantly impairs the ability of these operations to produce uh, and refine natural gas. Winter storms, URI, and Viola triggered natural gas value chain production outages that could be traced to these specific operational and environmental factors. Number one, upstream and midstream process equipment, namely pressure control valves, liquid gas separators, and level sensing controls, freeze off during due to extended, that is multiple days of cold temperatures below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, as these systems are not generally winterized in Texas. Liquids and hydrates contained in the production stream of oil, wet natural gas, and produced water were the catalysts that precipitated the freeze-off of these components. This was a somewhat minor factor in restricting flow of natural gas to the distribution system. Number two, <clears throat> The loss of power to the upstream and midstream production operations from the electrical supply grid, resulting in the interruption of process control instrumentation and liquids pumping activation, and subsequent shutdown or shut-in of the wells, oil, and gas production was a major factor in the interruption of natural gas production and was precipitated to a degree by the fact that only a relatively small number of upstream and midstream natural gas producers in the neighborhood of 100 or so had notified ERCOT, the Public Utilities Commission of Texas and the Railroad Commission of Texas that they were critical infrastructure operations vital to the generation of electrical power for the Texas electrical grid. 
And lastly, the interruption of the ability of third party critical supporting operations, namely field production, crew support, transportation services for oil and produced water from site uh, from the site to market or disposal, and resupply of production enhancement of chemicals and well production operations related to control, communications, equipment, and network services was tied to severe icy road conditions and some significant icing over of electric and telecommunication utility lines. And they were major factors that curtailed production from the oil and natural gas well sites. Electrically powered compressor stations lacking backup electrical generation capacity to power the compression stations controls shut down when electrical power was interrupted by the load shed. <clears throat> now that I've covered what happened in the field for natural gas production, I'm gonna have Wes Oliphant discuss the electrical power generation sector and convey opportunities to increase the reliability and resilience for natural gas production and interconnectedness with power generation. Wes? Thank you, Oliver. And thanks to the Texas section of ASE for organizing this seminar. I too was very honored to uh, serve on the committee that helped put this report together. So I'm, I'm very proud to, to be able to come before you today and talk about some of the things that uh, we discovered and wrote about in this report. My name is Wesley Oliphant. I'm, my background is that I am a 1974 graduate of Texas A&M University with a degree in civil engineering, and I am a professional engineer in the state of Texas. I became a member of ASCE as a student at A&M 50 years ago this year, in fact, so it's my anniversary year for, for being a member of ASCE. <clears throat> Upon graduation, I served in the United States Air Force as a civil engineering officer. And then post my Air Force service, I have and I've had and continue to have a great career designing, manufacturing, testing, inspecting, and providing life extension services for the wide variety of poles and towers that support the grid all over the United States. <clears throat> I'm currently co-founder and chief technical officer of Exo Group, LLC, headquartered here in Texas. In 2010, I was very honored to receive the Gene Wilhoyd Award presented by the Structural Engineering Institute for my significant lifetime contributions to the advancement of the art and science of transmission line engineering. I'm a fellow of ASCE, a fellow and charter member of the Structural Engineering Institute and a member of IEEE. Um, I'm currently chairman of the ASCE SEI's Committee of Electrical Transmission Structures and serve on the National Electric Safety Codes Subcommittee 5, which provides that code's requirements for strengths and loadings of utility structures and their components. This past four years, I was also honored to serve at the national level on ASCE's Committee of America, America's Infrastructure, which develops the ASCE Infrastructure Report Card published every four years. So that's my background and my qualification to speak here today. I always like to say, uh, that while electrical engineers provide the heartbeat of the electricity grid at 60 cycles per, per, per second, I might, uh, I might add, uh, we civil engineers and structural engineers work hard to provide the bones and muscles that keep the grid structurally reliable and resilient. So before we talk a little bit about uh, what happened to the electrical grid in Texas during winter storms, Uri and Viola, I thought it would be appropriate to give a little background on what the electrical grid is and how it works. Some of that was covered in the first webinar, but it's certainly worth repeating again. It may come as a surprise to some of you, um, but there's not a single national energy grid for electricity here in the United States. Instead, as can be seen in this slide, there are essentially three separate grids in the U.S. The Eastern Interconnect, um, which is further subdivided in the United States into five regional transmission organizations, or RTOs as they're referred to. And within those RTOs, there are 31 balancing authorities. And I'll talk about balancing authorities 
and what that means on some of the other slides. But balancing authorities are, are the authorities responsible for matching supply in of electricity to demand for electricity within a given area. ERCOT, and we all know ERCOT, it's the grid for most of us here in Texas. It's, it is its own RTO as well as its own balancing authority. <clears throat> we also have the Western Interconnect. The Western Interconnect has one RTO, primarily the California Independent S System Operator or CalISO, but within the Western Interconnect, there are 34 balancing authorities. Um, each of these three independent grids mostly operate in isolation. There are positives and negatives to that, but that's how the electricity system here in the U.S. is configured, and that's how it operates. <clears throat> the next slide is uh, the grid is a very complex network of systems and, and equipment components, but in broad terms, it's comprised of a network of generation, transmission, substations, and distribution facilities. Generation, as the name implies, are the facilities that produce electricity. About 90% of electricity generated in Texas is managed by ERCOT. There are some municipals and co-ops that are not part of ERCOT and not part of that, uh, that, that oversight. But ERCOT manages generation output from just over a thousand power generation facilities to keep the grid balanced. Approximately 44% of ERCOT's total generation capacity within ERCOT is fueled by natural gas. Currently, almost 38% of ERCOT's total generation capacity is wind and solar renewables generation. And I will add, this is by far the highest installed capacity of renewable generation than any other state. And this capacity in Texas has increased over the last decade from just over 6% of nameplate capacity to now pushing 40% of ERCOT's nameplate capacity resource. Coal-fire generation is currently about 12% of ERCOT's total generation capacity, but that has dropped over the past decade from a peak of about 40%. And then hydroelectric and nuclear make up the balance of the nameplate capacity about 6%. So you see there's been a change of mix over the last decade from a position of less dependence on coal-fire generation to a position of increased dependence on natural gas and significant renewable generation. And that's important to note. This is a lesson that other grid entities in the United States are learning to deal with as well. The mix of generation sources is changing and that is significant for us to understand. The next component is transmission. And this is the systems of poles and towers and wires that move the electricity from the generators to where it could be used. This is really the area of my expertise, uh, but, but again, it's all part of the grid. Within ERCOT, there are almost 53,000 miles of transmission lines. ERCOT oversees the flow of electricity through all of these lines and ensures that the balance between electricity demand and electricity supply is maintained. And we're gonna talk about that balance in a moment. And then substations, there are, these are the connecting points of all the transmission circuits and where the high voltage transmission steps down into lower voltages that can then be distributed um, further down the line. With their NERCOT, there are about 5,000 substations that are the connecting points. These are the highway intersections, so to speak, of all the transmission lines that, that travel through Texas. And then finally, distribution. This is the lower voltage wire system that finally makes it, um, finally makes delivery of electrical power to our homes and our businesses and industry possible. It should be noted that for about 85% of the consumers of electricity in Texas over the past 20 years, the generation and retail components of the electricity system here in Texas has been deregulated to promote more market competition. Again, generally municipal systems and cooperatives are a bit of an exception to that, but for 85% of us, uh, we, we operate in a deregulated uh, generation and retail operation. The wires companies are still regulated as it makes no sense to duplicate those facilities. The complexity of the grid is that the electric grid must maintain balance and equilibrium at all times. 
Supply, the generation of electricity, must always match demand, the consumption of electricity. And that balance must be maintained and it must happen in real time. We can't store electricity. This is the reason for the balancing authorities mentioned earlier and why we have to have an entity to manage that balance. We cannot store electricity in significant amounts, that's changing. But when, we, but when there is an increasing demand for electricity, when all the ACs kick in as temperatures rise during the day or electric heating strips kick in as temperatures fall during the night, the supply of electricity must be immediately turned on to match that increasing demand. The operating frequency, as I mentioned earlier, is 60, 60 hertz or 60 cycles per second. And if that begins to vary if supp when supply and demand are not balanced real time, we run into real problems. In simple terms, if there's too much demand for electricity, again, we turn our heaters on or our ACs on and, and, we, and we end up with an increase in demand and we do not have enough electricity being generated and fed into the wires to meet that demand, the frequency on those lines drops. And that is what really began to happen on early morning of February 15, 2021. Too much demand, not enough supply, we talk about why the supply didn't happen, but we're going to, that's what happened. And we started to run into frequency variation. Only so much frequency variation can occur before design and safety constraints of the grid begin to kick in to avoid catastrophic equipment damage to the various components of the grid. <clears throat> the next slide is ERCOT, really all operators and all of the different uh, uh, interconnects rely on two types of generation. And this was also covered in the first webinar, but again, worth repeating again, because it's how the grid works. Non-dispatchable or intermediate gener generation, intermittent generation is, is generation capacity that's available only when the energy source is available. Wind and solar generation is an example of that. It is only available when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. Dispatchable generation, on the other hand, is capacity that has a fuel source that the theoretically can be turned on and turned off or ramped up and rammed, ramped down based on the demand and needs of the system. <clears throat> During URI and Viola winter events, a total of approximately 48% of the expected available generation capacity went offline. Well, we will talk about what happened during the winter storm events on the next slides. I think it should be ejected in here that while non-dispatchable generation, wind and solar, did have generation capacity go offline due to winterization issues, most of the generation from those sources were expected to be offline and predicted to be offline. The bulk of the unexpected loss of generation capacity came from the dispatchable generators primarily the loss of thermal generation units. With that background of the grid, it brings us to what happened uh, to the electrical power system here in Texas during the winter storms, Uri and Viola. We've talked about this before, but over the course of these two winter events, the lengthy duration of sub-freezing temperatures combined with freezing rain uh, almost over the entire state of Texas created havoc on almost every segment of the critical infrastructure in Texas. It turned into a death spiral for electricity generation. As I said, nearly 48% of the required and expected generation capacity needing to be supplied, which was approximately 51.2 gigawatts of power, went offline. The majority of that generation and generation capacity went offline was thermal generation, and that thermal generation be coal, nuclear, and natural gas fuel generation. Natural gas, though, was the bulk of that total. The cause was both due to freezing of equipment in the power plants, due to lack of winterization, but also due to significant interdependencies we have discussed with adequate fuel availability, primarily the circularity of interdependency between natural gas production and transport and electricity generated using that natural gas. The only option left to maintain stability of the grid once the frequency started to vary was to reduce demand through emergency curtailment or load shed. 
The load shed measures, which are a curtailment of power to certain segments of the grid, inadvertently began to further affect natural gas production and transport facilities that were not already impacted by freeze ups. That's the circularity that we were discussing. The emergency curtailment was in effect for more than 100 hours as the balance between supply and demand for electricity was working to be re regained. This slide provides ERCOT's breakdown of the causes of the, of the electrical power generation outages during winter storms during Viola. As noted here, at the peak of the events, about 50% of the generator outages at D-rates were weather-related, winterization issues. Just under 40% were equipment and fuel limitation issues. And just over 10% of the outage, outages that were existing during this event were actually planned maintenance that could not be stopped for these events. As many of you know, next slide, as many of you know, as listening to this, uh, the grid came perilously close to a complete shutdown. Uh, this is a slide that was repeated in the first, from repeated from the first seminar. We know we were approximately four and a half minutes away from, from that grid shutdown occurring. Such a grid shutdown would have put the entire Texas grid into a black start situation, a scenario where the entire electrical grid would have to be restarted from scratch due to the shutdown. It's important to note that black start is not to be confused with what we all experienced as a blackout when the power was just taken offline due to those load shed requirements. Black start is not a matter of just throwing the switch back on. It's a very time consuming process, taking weeks, if not months, depending on the damage to equipment that such a catastrophic grid shutdown event would have triggered. As pointed out in the first webinar, the team putting together this report did spend a good amount of time discussing the potential ramifications of such a grid collapse situation. The potential consequences that, that, that would have unimaginably occurred uh, would have had human and economic costs beyond belief. So we must never ever let that happen. If it does, we certainly need to have a, a backstop that's reliable. The backstop or fail-safe system here in, at ERCOT is the Black Start Plan consisting of a total of 28 primary and secondary standby backup generators that are supposed to be ready to go at all times. To that end, post-storm study indicated there were either weatherization or fuel source issues with 21 of those 28 combined secondary and primary Black Start generators that would have need, been needed to restart the grid. 75%, as noted here, of the most critical generators needed as a fail safe to restart the grid failed to reliably operate during these events. That just cannot be allowed to happen. And we are all, all are very fortunate that we didn't need them for Black Start purposes. The grid stabilized due to the efforts of the ERCOT folks and the last load shed uh, orders given uh, provided that uh, stabilization. The simple complexity is that we all expect electricity to be available at the flip of a switch. We all expect the electrical grid to be able to handle extreme weather events like URI and Viola. And as we've all discussed, the grid is a very complex and dynamic machine. We have to learn from this event. And I think that's part of the, the purpose of this study. <clears throat> Among the most important of those lessons is that the majority of the gas supply failures were experienced by electric power generation facilities that came to rely on interruptible gas supply and or interruptible transportation. If it's interruptible, it's unreliable. And gas generation facilities have an obligation to address that interdependency with gas producers to ensure reliable production and transportation to get that gas to those facilities. Failure to fix 
the root causes of this problem will result in increased frequency and duration of events like those experienced from winter storm Uri and Viola because electri uh, electrification interdependencies are not going to go away. They're going to continue to be in place and it's going to get worse if we don't address them now. What are the recommendations the team developed? General recommendations, as we all know, and realistically and practically, we will never be able to, with certainty, predict and avoid with some unknown event may affect the electrical grid in the future. We learn from this event and we move forward. Among the recommended actions in this report from our team was that we need to invest in black start generation to ensure reliable and resilient fail safe power for a grid restart if it is ever needed. And it should always be viewed as a critical safety net of last resort, but it absolutely has to work when it is needed. And that's why it made the top of the list of recommendations. We should collectively work to understand and mitigate the growing critical interdependencies between infrastructure segments. Improved winterization of both the generators as well as natural gas production and transport system would be a part of that mitigation as well as a more robust registration and communication of those critical infrastructures that have those interdependencies. With that communication, distribution utilities can better plan circuits that will be load shed when ordered. And much of those uh, recommendations are already being implemented as I understand it. And we should work to prioritize reliability and resiliency focused regulations and eliminate regulations that have the unincluded unintended consequence of creating negative reliability and resiliency impacts. We should work to replace process and model biases with reliability and resiliency prioritized culture. And we need to find a way to be predictive of future events with less emphasis on what has happened in the past. Learn from the past for sure, but let's not rely on the past as an absolute predictor of the future. And finally, industry-specific recommendations on the natural gas side are winterize. Register as critical infrastructure with ERCOT, PUC, and TRC, and develop the contingency plans needed for field crews to respond effectively during extreme weather events. On the electricity side, same thing with generators, winterize. Add fuel, dual fuel source capability as backup if possible. Establish firm supply and firm transport of natural gas needed to effectively operate and improve communications with fuel suppliers in advance to adequately ensure capacity when these type of events are forecast. I thank you for your attention. I'll now turn the call back over to Mark Boyd to wrap up and for a Q&A. All right. Um, thank you, Wes. Um, that was a great, great presentation. Um, and I think some of the things that you reiterated uh, from the first uh, webinar certainly bears repeating. And I think that's part of the way we all learn and get educated. And some, some in the audience may not have attended the first webinar. Um, we have a few minutes until our stop time uh, on this. And I do have a few uh, uh, Q&A questions. Uh, Prosper Makanya from my office right here across the hall in the, on the north wing of the building here. Uh, I'm going to composite his two questions into one. The question uh, revolves around uh, the uh, generation mix. Uh, so I think the, the gist here is what is the optimal generation mix that we're shooting for? Uh, what is that target generation type mix? And what is the projected time it will take to get there? Well, I'll, I'll try to tackle that. I think um, the interesting thing is that we're all learning how to deal with that change, that transition um, from the, the, the more traditional generation fuels that have been used in the past, coal, nuclear, uh, natural gas. Um, we're, 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 we're understanding better how to integrate renewables into it. Renewables are going to 
be an important part of the fuel sources going forward, no question about it. But we have to understand that they're not as dispatchable uh, in Jeff Roberts' words. Uh, and so we have to be able to figure out how to deal with that. I mean, there, are, there have been days here in Texas where renewables have supplied more than 50% of the capacity that was needed uh, for electric power. But there's days where it's just not available. So we have to be able to understand how to ramp both of those up and down as needed. Um, and I don't know that there is an optimal mix, but we have to learn how to deal with all of them. And we have to learn how to um, make sure that we have enough capacity standing by for these kinds of events uh, so that we're not finding out that we don't have the wind or we don't have the solar but we need to, we, our air conditioners are running or our heaters are running and we need, we need power now. So I, I don't know that there's an optimal mix, but I know ERCOT is not alone in trying to deal with this issue. Uh, that is probably one of the biggest challenges facing our transition uh, to renewables all across the United States and really all across the world for that matter. Okay, uh, thank you, Wes. Next question from Dallas May, also here in my office at LCA. Uh, what, uh, you know, specific to Black Start, what has ERCOT done so far to invest in Black Start, which is our top recommendation? Black Start regeneration. Well, I'm not, I'm not totally uh, clear on all the steps other than they've implemented testing programs to make sure those generators are operating. Uh, there are there are things being looked at for dual fuel source capability for some of those generators. Uh, there is winterization going on for some of those uh, uh, generators as well. Uh, I know ERCOT's paid a lot of attention to it from what I've read. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of attention being paid to it because it was, uh, again, as, as Mark, as you and Oliver and I and the rest of the, uh, the team discussed, we do not want to test that out in real time. It, um, so, and, I, and I think it, it scared a lot of folks. So there's a lot of attention being paid to it right now. Okay. May I just quickly add that sure. affirming what Wes has said, yes, that is the top priority uh, that ERCOT is pursuing. Uh, they also are have stated that uh, reliability and resilience are now uh, at the forefront of the way that they are analyzing uh, opportunities for improving the network and managing the network, uh, the grid, if you will. So uh, we have it from the horse's mouth that that is uh, the top priority, black start and uh, focusing on making the uh, network the grid more reliable and resilient. All right. Your question from James Merchant. I uh, hope I got your name uh, pronounced correctly. Uh, Wes, what specific steps from your five recommendations have been initiated in earnest? And I, and I think we kind of addressed that, but um, but it, I don't know if you'd have anything to add on that. Well, I I think the the uh, in general, I think the lessons learned really are, are the interdependency lessons. That's, you know, in the, in the past, when we've talked about reliability and resiliency of the grid here in Texas, we've talked about ice storms taking lines down, or we've had winterization issues in the power plants before as well. So we focused on that. Um, maybe, you know, as I, as I read all of the uh, follow-up uh, past, the past storm event versus this one, maybe we didn't take winterization quite as seriously as we should have, but we, we have generally looked at, at reliability and resilience of the grid at the grid itself. We have not looked at nearly as close at the interdependency of uh, all of the infrastructure and the, the increased electrification that's going on um, part of part of some of the research that I did uh, for this team was we looked at how many more houses are now uh, heat 
uh, the heating systems are electric heat pumps rather than natural gas uh, furnaces. How many are, you know, all are, there's a lot of electric homes being built these days as opposed to 30 or 40 years ago. So we have to understand that the grid is a very dynamic um, uh, machine, but the demand on that grid on that machine is changing constantly as well. And mm -hmm. And I, and I think, again, I think we're learning those lessons. Every time we see these, these types of events, we learn those lessons. I hope that uh, uh, ERCOT and PUC will take into consideration. I think Oliver and Jeff met with uh, the ERCOT director. So I think, I think those words are being heeded. All right. Um, May I just add that they're yes, not sir. only being heeded by ERCOT, but the Public Utilities Commission uh, at the direction of the uh, uh, Senate Business and Commerce Committee uh, is focused very uh, distinctly on the subject of uh, increasing the reliability of the grid. Uh, there are modifications in the way that the grid is being managed now uh, that uh, address the potential for power uh, outages. Uh, and we, and it's also noteworthy to say that uh, future management of the grid will also involve consumers of power. Uh, in Europe, uh, power consumption is managed not only uh, by the grid operators, but they also basically uh, are in a position to control thermostats in homes so as to uh, create some minor uh, reduction in demand uh, without creating for the uh, end consumers, the homeowners, uh, some discomfort. Right. Well, there are several more questions, so to get go to stay on time here, I'm going to sure. get to those, and um, <clears throat> and uh, we have about uh, seven minutes before one o'clock. We may go over, but what if uh, any of these recommendations require new legislation? That question from Dallas May. Wes, you want to take a stab at that? Well, I, I I'm not sure that. I'm not sure that any of it requires new legislation, to be honest with you. We just need to, from a technical standpoint, just address the issues. And, and I think the folks that, uh, you know, I think the folks that are managing our grid and all the utilities that are involved in our grid, um, again, learned a lot of lessons in this storm. I think from, from ERCOT's side, we learned that how that you know, we, we can't rely necessarily on the past history and the averages of uh, supply and demand in, in these kinds of storms. I think we also, on the utility side, learned that there's probably a smarter way to do load shed. There's probably smarter ways to think about um, um, implementing battery storage and, and uh, microgrids into the grid. But all of that's going to all of that technology takes time to develop and it takes time to understand how to uh, integrate it all in to make us more reliable and resilient going forward. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that is a point I think that, that we made in the first webinar is that averages mean nothing and, and, and the clickbait that's out there on the internet that tries to pretend like averages mean something and we have the solution just just don't don't fit we need to we need to have this intricate detailed look at the solution should uh, should ERCOT next question from Rob should ERCOT be connected to the other two to the two other national grid systems to ensure further reliability well that's that is a uh, a big question and ERCOT is connected but in a very minor way there are there are a couple of connection points uh um, that we can interconnect. But during Winter Storm Uri and Viola, uh, the, the, the interconnections that we have, even as small as they were, wouldn't have helped much because the other, the other entities were suffering just as much as we were. 
and they didn't have power to spare, even if even if we were interconnected. So the the downside is on those interconnections when you when you start interconnecting. One of the reasons U.S. is split into three grids, it's easier to manage three smaller chunks than one big chunk from a reliability standpoint. So if we were all interconnected and in a way that, uh, um, that we may have some loss of control of, of how that whole grid that is balanced, stays balanced. And, and so I think there's some negative effects. Uh, ERCOT does it for a different reason than, um, you know, the reliability resilience issue, but but I think uh, there are negatives to interconnecting. We probably should have um, some more interconnections just because we, we want to be able to turn them on and turn them off when we can, but don't, don't think that the interconnections would have solved the problem here. Yeah, there may be some uh, national security implications on the whole concept in my mind too. Absolutely. Uh, is... Uh, so next question from Jody, is Texas unusual or do the other U.S. grids face similar issues? And I think you kind of answered that. Yeah, all the, all the grids, all the interconnects, all the uh, balancing authorities, they all face the same issues. Okay. Um, and again, I, I, I pointed out that Texas is probably leading the way um, with understanding that transition from you know, the conventional generation capacity resources to renewables, we've got, again, 40% of our capacity is renewables. And uh, that by far is the, is the highest amount of any of the other entities. So, you know, maybe it's one of those things as we're, we're gonna learn the lesson and share it with the other operating entities so that they don't repeat some of the problems that we've had. All right, this next question is again from James Merchant. Um, and this is an excellent question, a simple and direct question that I, I hoped would be asked, because this is something I learned being part of this committee. So what is a black start generator? And is that a complete power plant facility or a standalone generator? Uh, it's a good question. And I don't know that I know the answer. Do you know the answer to it, Oliver? My understanding yes. is that it's a, go ahead, if you know the answer. Yes, the black a black start generator generation facility is one facility in a bank of facilities uh, of generators that is uh, sanctioned, if you will, to be used to restart other generating uh, op of other generators. So if we take, say, the uh, I'm, the W.A. Parish facility in Houston, which has seven generating uh, opera, sev seven generators, one of those generators could be designated for a black start and maintained uh, and compensated uh, for that operation. I'm not saying that W.A. Parish it has a black start generator. I'm just using their uh, seven units as an example. So the answer to the question is, it's not a standalone facility sitting out in the middle of nowhere. It is typically aligned with other generating units. Okay, we have two more questions and then we'll go ahead and let uh, Mike wrap this up. Mike, Mike and Ron, if you wanna also throw in. Uh, this is from Otis Foster. Uh, he's the former uh, executive director of ASC, by the way, years ago. Will ASC uh, Texas section have a chance to provide input to the state energy plan advisory committee? I read that they have taken no public input. Please please correct me if that is not right, not is, that is incorrect. Thanks for all your hard work on this effort to improve our electric grid. You're welcome, Otis. Go, go ahead, uh, either uh, Oliver or West. Well, I think Jeff has been invited to, uh, Jeff and Oliver both, I think, have made a round robin effort to contact a lot of folks. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure, maybe Oliver can comment on who has invited us to uh, talk to them, but uh, there's been a lot of folks interested in the work that we did, and I think that's, that's admirable. We did file with the Public Utilities Commission 
uh, in September, uh, the September October timeframe of 2021, uh, and those recommend our recommendations uh, have been taken forward. Uh, we continue through the efforts of Mike Bloom uh, and the segment of the uh, Texas ASCE uh, to petition leaders, uh, including Senator Swartner's Office of Business and Commerce, who really has the, the, the major impact. Uh, and so the advocacy continues and uh, we'll take under advisement your uh, suggestion to go before this committee that you brought up. I think, I think Mark, if I could add, uh, you mentioned it early on, part of the reason for these webinars is to engage a lot of individuals out there to also uh, take that message forward to a lot of the uh, the political folks that, that will certainly have some input in, into this resolution. All right, I do have one more open question, but I'm not really, it, it may be an add on to Rob's initial question about, I think it was about Black Start, as far as the question is in emergency situations, but all this is about emergency situations because, because that's, that's the committee's, uh, you know, reliability, the word reliability is in, in, uh, in the name, but, uh, but what we consider reliability is people don't get hurt or killed, and that would be in emergency situations. Um, uh, so unless, unless uh, that, that question can be expanded on, that would be my answer. What about y'all? Agreed. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good answer for that as well. I think reliability means different things to different people, but I think you've explained it well, Mark. Okay. Um, uh, all right. Well, that, that wraps up the Q&A. We're right at 1.03 p.m., a little bit better than last time. Um, uh, 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 Ron, do you, want, do you want to say a few words if you're still online? And otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to, to Mike for some uh, administrative and announcements. Uh, we're taking this on the road to uh, to CECON in September, by the way. Uh, Oliver and uh, and Jeff Roberts, the rock stars, are going to be uh, making a presentation and a keynote, and I'll, and I'll uh, on the Friday keynote, and I'll, I'll play a small role in that. Uh, Ron, do you have anything? Ron hopped off. Yeah, no, okay. I'll, uh, I'll just wrap it up. Uh, I want to say thanks once again to the three of you, Mark, Oliver, and Wes, for joining us and for presenting today. Uh, as mentioned before, individuals will receive that certificate of attendance in their email. Uh, if you're interested in presenting one of these sessions, please email vptech at texasce.org. Uh, we can get you some more information on kind of the requirements and the time frame for presenting. And lastly, we're always available for your questions. We hope to hear from you soon. Uh, this is going to conclude the session for today. And thank you all. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.